Okay. Electronegativity, so we're going to do a little bit of review back to chapter 12 because it's important. Electronegativity is important. Okay, particularly if anybody has to move up through any level of organic chemistry, you need to understand the concept of electronegativity. Okay? You have to. Electronegativity is the ability for one atom to steal electrons from another atom. And that happens in a bond. The more electronegative atom is fluorine, the most. The least electronegative is cesium. When we move into intermolecular forces in unit four, we're going to talk about a special intermolecular force. Has anybody heard the term intermolecular force before? No? Uh, has anybody heard of hydrogen bonding? Yes. Okay. People that have heard of hydrogen bonding, when do you have hydrogen bonding? And there's hydrogen in the bond. Anybody want to add to that? What's that? Two hydrogens in the bond? No. So we might look at the term and think it's a bond. We're bonding two hydrogens next to each other, and that's absolutely not true. It's actually not a bond. Okay? Hydrogen bonding happens when you have a molecule that has a hydrogen that is physically bound to fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Why fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen? They're the most electronegative. Okay, hydrogen bonding is such a strong intermolecular force that we sometimes refer to it as bonding, typically done by biologists incorrectly. Okay, it is not a bond. It's a force. It's a strong attraction that happens because of the large difference in electronegativity. If you know your trends in electronegativity, you can predict those reactivities. Okay, so it becomes an important concept to kind of grab a hold of. Okay. Ionization energy is kind of a fun one, which I said we were going to skip. Ionization energy, depending on how it is calculated, is a contributing factor to electronegativity. Okay. So what is ionization energy? It might be the energy required to remove an electron. A couple people laughed. Thank you. Those people were at least awake. Okay. That is our ionization energy. It's the ability to remove an electron. That sounds kind of like electronegativity, except electronegativity is the ability from one atom to remove an electron from another atom. In this case, we're just taking an electron away. Where's the electron going? Not to another atom. It's going to nothingness. It's going to the vacuum. Okay. So they're similar concepts, but different end results. The different end result makes a really big deal. Okay. Which electron am I likely to remove from an atom? The outermost orbital. The highest energy level electrons likely to be the one I'm talking about. Okay. That makes the most sense for my ionization energy, because that's going to be the easiest to grab a hold of. And that is indeed what we talk about. Okay. So if we went through to look at, say, hydrogen versus lithium, which one might we expect to have a larger ionization energy? So larger ionization means it requires more energy to rip the electron away. Hydrogen or lithium? Lithium. Okay. We've got two lithiums. Here's a nucleus. Joe, how do you spell that again? Call it the center of the atom. There's our first energy level. There's our second energy level. Real basic, right? If we look at hydrogen, where's hydrogen's electron? In the first energy level. In the first energy level. So there's my first energy level. If I look at lithium, where's its outermost electron? The second energy level. When I'm talking about ripping away the electron, I'm talking about ripping it away to nothingness. To nothingness. What's the name of our nothingness? The void, yeah, nice try. Not a bad idea, but no. It's another V word. Our vacuum, which I also can't spell. This is our picture. For me to rip the hydrogen electron away, how much energy must I supply? That electron has to go from the first energy level to? Is the second energy level the vacuum? No, where does it have to go? 
to the vacuum. How about for lithium? Where does it have to go? To the vacuum. Which of those is a larger energy jump? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Okay. Interesting. We're using an electron orbital diagram to predict ionization energies. Okay. Hydrogen and lithium are in the same column. If we take a look at this, the ionization energy increases as you go from the bottom to the top in a group. Lithium underneath hydrogen has a lower ionization than hydrogen. Why? Pictures. Look at that. Answers the question for us. So when we talk about electron configurations, there's an application to it. It isn't just pretty pictures. You can just agree that my pictures are pretty. Okay? We're using them. We're applying that knowledge outwards. Okay? If you don't want to apply it, what do you have to do? You have to memorize it. You have to memorize that statement. Okay? What happens when we go left to right? So let's go lithium to beryllium. Where's beryllium's outermost electron? The second energy level. So there's beryllium's. If I remove it, what has to happen? Goes to the vacuum. What's the energy difference between beryllium and lithium? Ah, oh, we might say it's the same. But we notice there's an actual trend there. Okay. What happened to the size of the orbitals when we moved left to right? The atomic radius got smaller, which meant for beryllium that last electron is a little bit lower in energy, which means it's a larger distance. Okay? So we can track that with our period. The ionization increases as we go left to right. If we go from left lithium to beryllium, the ionization goes up. Cool. So we could memorize that, and we could start to do references in blue. I need to delete those because ultimately those are now like bad misconceptions, but we won't stress about that. Okay? Does that kind of make sense with those statements? get the idea behind that. So if we understand electron configurations and radii, we can predict ionization energy. That's kind of neat. If we don't want to do all that memory or understanding of our process, we then have to memorize these. Does anybody see any potential problems popping up with memorizing these? In general, the sky is blue. Does that mean always the sky is blue? No. No, sometimes the sky is black or orange or red. All right, so it's not always blue. Here's a trend that you now memorize, and you probably say it's always true. And then some little jerk off puts in the name in general in front of it, and your whole system for memorizing this has now fallen to pieces. All right? If we understand how and why these things are the way they are by looking at our electron configurations, we don't have to worry about memorizing a trend. We can actually explain those counterexamples. Okay, so this is kind of a nasty looking diagram. Okay, but if we start, the very first dot happens at one with the atomic number. So that very first dot there is representing one, what is one atomic number? Hydrogen. When I move to two as an atomic number, I would be at? Helium. So what we're referencing is moving left to right. What happened to the ionization as we move left to right? It went up. What happened? Oh, it went up. Interesting. How about when I go from hydrogen to lithium? It goes down. Why would it go down? I'm at a new energy level. That lithium outermost electron at the second energy level is closer to the vacuum. It requires less energy. The trend drops. So, so far, everything matches exactly as it shows. And if we look kind of ballpark pictures through this, left to right, there it goes. It increases. Left to right. Everybody see that? It increases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Down a column, what happens? 
it decreases. Everything's fine and dandy. We go, everything's cool. Take a look right here. Did it go up? No, it went down. Why would it do that? Okay, so there's an argument. We're moving into a different orbital. Okay, and that's a decent argument that I'm going to refute here in a second. But I like where you're going with that. We're talking about which elements? Beryllium moving to boron. So the initial observation is, yes, that is jumping to a different orbital. There's a big old gap there in the periodic table. That's why we get an exception. Except we move further up the line, and what do we see? Another exception. That exception is between what two elements? This is nitrogen and oxygen. Did we switch orbitals? No. So good observation. We do have a jump there in orbital, but we don't have it here. So the observation doesn't hold true. Something else has to be going on there. What do you got? I remember reading somewhere, and I can't exactly remember why, but I remember reading that nitrogen for some reason has um, a different, I think a higher electronegativity than oxygen does. So we want to pause a little bit here, and that's actually not true. Okay. They might be referring to the ionization energy. Okay. Ionization energy is not electronegativity. Two entirely separate things. Okay? Electronegativity is referring to two atoms. Ionization energy is a single atom. Okay? So different ideas. Okay? And so you read somewhere that nitrogen has a higher ionization than oxygen. So we'll switch your word. You're right, absolutely. So does that mean I have to memorize the exception? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And that exception? Mm -hmm. And that one? And then all of those? Yeah. Ouch. Okay. And I would argue that we can use Disney to explain this. Yeah, this is kind of fun. We can use Disney. It stumbled across this. It was phenomenal. Okay. Which example do you want to take a look at? Beryllium boron or nitrogen oxygen? Because believe it or not, it's the same argument in both cases. Beryllium and boron. Beryllium and boron. Okay. So we're going to start with beryllium. And if you remember on that previous slide, I said the thing that we needed to look at was electron configurations. So the first thing we're going to have to do is write out the electron configuration. What is the electron configuration for beryllium? Uh, 1s2, 2s2. 1s2, 2s2. We're going to do the same thing. I already forgot the element. Boron. What is its electron configuration? What is ionization energy? The amount of energy to remove an electron. So if I remove an electron from beryllium, what would happen to its charge? It would become more positive. What positive would it become? I removed one electron, it would become plus one. So I could say we're moving to Be plus, and I can specify that charge in the upper right-hand corner, and my configuration becomes 1s2, 2s1. Okay? What happens to boron? Exact same thing. We become 1s2, 2s2, and we're done, right? Okay, so what we're talking about doing is transitioning from Be to Be plus, and from B to B plus. So why well, I don't see the Disney here. Really, does anybody see the Disney yet? No. Okay. So now what we can do is envision our favorite Disney character. Okay, this is a little bit better than past examples. Favorite Disney character. If you cut them in half, this is why we're doing Disney, you know. For those people that didn't like Disney, here you go. You cut them in half, mirror them across that half. And don't be like cutting Simba in half through the body, like <laughs> down the headline. Okay? Do they reflect perfectly? Yeah. yeah. Okay? They actually are perfectly symmetrical. Okay? We can do this with humans too, except don't cut them in half. They're like internet memes where they, they reflect you know, famous people's faces across a mirror line. 
If they actually do it correctly, and most of the time they're done horribly because they're more funny when they're done horribly, <laughs> when done correctly, what do we end up finding? They're perfectly symmetrical. Symmetry is important. That last orbital for beryllium, I have a sphere, and what have I done with it? I have perfectly filled it with two electrons. Right? Not to lead you on with any of the kind of words there. Perfectly filled it, which would mean? It would be symmetric. And as we learned from Disney, the things that are symmetric tend to be beautifuls. They're beauty. Right? You don't look at Belle and be like, oh, that princess is ugly. Right? That doesn't happen. Right? What happened with Berlin Plus? I took that perfectly symmetrical orbital and what did I do? I took away an electron. Is it as symmetrical? No. Now it became ugly. And since ugly is a bad term, we invent a new term. We call it? Okay. Move this to real world life. I have a magic stick. Okay. And I'm going to come up to you. You are beautiful. I come up to you with this magic beat stick. And I say, I will beat you with this stick. And you will become a beast. I mean, you'd be like, yep, sign me up. <laughs> you know? Nobody. Just me. You're not, you're going to fight back, right? Okay. What happened to boron? 2p1. How many orbitals are 2p? How many orbitals are 2p? It's a hint. It is greater than 1. 3, 2px, 2py, 2pz. I've placed one electron in there. Is that very symmetric? No. What did I just make? A beast. I've got a beast. Boron starts as a beast. What happens after I remove an electron? Here I come with my magic beat stick. <laughs> You're now all beastly. I come up with my beat stick and say, I will hit you with this stick and you will become beautiful. Most people, I would never do that. Average populace, there's a reason we have plastic surgeons. Okay? And trust me, well, you can't trust me because I've never done it. Okay? I'm pretty sure during plastic surgery, you're under anesthesia for a reason because that hurts. Okay? That, that's a beat stick. Someone is coming at you with a beat stick to make you look beautiful. Okay? You transition from being a beast to a beauty. Is that something you might be like, okay. I may not be happy about it. That's going to hurt. So, like, hold up. Let me get braced for it. But swing away. Boron agrees. Says, yeah. I, I'll accept that. I'll, I'll deal with the pain. So what does that mean? Boron going from a beast to a beauty. Yes, it's going to hurt. So there is some energy involved in it. But is that energy going to be that high? No, because the end result is I become beautiful. So what happens to boron's energy? It drops a little bit. Beryllium started beautiful. You're going to make it ugly. What's it going to do? It's going to fight back, which means the energy goes up. It is those two counteracting things that cause the exception to the trend. There is no exception to the trend. It's following electron configurations and how those things align. If you go through and look at the electron configurations and understand them, there's not a, it's not a trend to memorize. It's applying what you know about electron configurations. And a little bit of Disney. You know, best of all the worlds. Chemistry and Disney. <laughs> Kind of make sense? Somewhat. Somewhat. Still a little bit lost. Right? Which is fair. First time you've seen it, you've got to apply it. This is applying very heavy, hard to deal with concepts and trying to match them into this. That's what's happening within your ionization energies. Right? That's why you see those trends. Look at nitrogen and oxygen. The exact same issue is happening. Right? That one is admittedly harder to identify. 
because it's not as clean of a jump, but the same thing is happening with nitrogen and oxygen. Every single one of these exceptions comes down to an electron configuration going from a beauty to a beast, which means the ionization energy spikes a little bit. Beast to a beauty, it drops a little bit. And it's that transition is why it's happening. Right? I think that's really cool. If you don't, well, sorry I burned the last 15 minutes of your life. Right? Questions? Yes? I think I remember on the passage exam for exam one, I remember it, that question being explained why nitrogen and oxygen are the exception. And I like had no idea. And I was like, I don't know this. That's why I didn't ask it on the test. Thank God. Okay? Okay. Now I, now I see it. Okay. So, nitrogen and oxygen are the same thing. Electron affinity is kind of the reverse of ionization energy. So don't stress on electron affinity. Electron affinity is the energy to grab an electron from the vacuum. So I'm an atom now, and I want an electron. So I pull the electron from the vacuum. What charge would I become? Negative. I become negatively charged. So it's the opposite of ionization energy. If I put these two concepts together and come up with some mathematic mumbo jumbo, I get electronegativity. Okay, or one way to account for the calculation of electronegativity. Okay? So that's all I really want you to get out of that is recognizing what happens with the charges, and you're good. Okay? With our ionic radii, okay, what's happening with these? Because I don't think we covered the radii, right? Didn't you hear that? Good. All right, if I go through and take a sodium atom and I mix it with a chlorine atom, okay, those are neutral atoms. How do I know those are neutral? There's no charge specified in the upper right-hand corner of either of those symbols. Okay? If I mix them with each other, they can go through and form a reaction. How do I know a reaction is happening here? The biggest answer is that we have a big arrow here. Another big answer, what happened to the name? What happened to the name? It just changed, which means... Chemical reaction happened. Keep it as simple as that. Okay? So we're going to have a cation and an anion. Cations are positive. positive. Whoa. Let's try that backwards a little bit. That's what happens when you push the wrong button. Positive, because cats are positive. If it works, it works. I'm not going to complain. Um, and then anions are negative. Which one should be the cation? Which one should be the anion? Meta metals typically become cations, so you could memorize that, which means we're going to get sodium as the positive. What charge positive should the sodium be? Why just plus one and not, say, plus two? Easiest answer, it's in the first column. And I memorize that every atom in the first column has a plus one charge. Why does it have a plus one charge? Those charges are trying to look like the noble gases. It is easiest for sodium to lose one electron to look like neon. So that is why sodium carries a plus one. Okay? You can memorize the rule. You can deal with the trends. So sodium is a plus one. The chloride or chlorine. What happens to the chlorine? It's going to be our anion. Should it be Cl minus three? No. Why just minus one? Okay. We could say it's the halogens. They're all minus one. It's easiest for it to gain one electron to look like argon okay. than any of the other noble gases. Okay. What this is now pushing for, which you kind of see with the hint of it being titled ionic radii, and then this R here saying some numbers about radii, is what's going to happen to the radius of the atom. Is it going to decrease? So both sodium and chloride should be smaller. No, sodium will decrease. Why should sodium's radius get smaller? The radius is the electrons make up the radius, and if you're losing an electron, they form smaller. Okay, is that true? If I lose electrons, I always get smaller. Not, not always. Remember our atomic trends. The atomic trends are misleading when we shift to the ionic radii. Why would they be misleading? When we looked at our atomic trends left to right in the electron count, we also had to be concerned about the nucleus. 
Do I need to worry about the nucleus for ionic radii? No. Why not? Because I'm switching from sodium to sodium ion. Did I change the nucleus? No. 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 All I've changed are the electrons. Okay. So I can just reference the electron change to identify size changes. Okay. Because that's all that's changing. So sodium ion is going to be smaller. Chloride ion will be bigger. larger. Why should it be larger? I don't know why I switched that. Sorry, you said bigger. I think I had to be contrary and use a different word. I apologize. You said bigger. There it is. It's bigger. Why does it get bigger? We're putting more electrons into it. It can't hold more electrons, so it gets bigger. Right? That's all we're trying to identify here. Yeah, I didn't want to do that. All right. So if we go through and look at it, we see those size changes with the numbers. Do I expect you to memorize the numbers? No. I expect you to understand those trends. I started here because it's on the. It is not on the periodic table. Your radii is not there. Okay. You would have to actually look those up. Okay. So I don't expect you to know that. I do just expect you to know what's happening with those. Okay. Bigger or smaller. We move to covalent bonds. This becomes a little bit different. Okay. Because it's a covalent bond, there's now a sharing of electrons. In the ionic bond, it was a complete transfer of electrons. Sodium lost its electron, chloride gained it. Covalent bonds are different because the difference in electronegativity is smaller. Okay? This means that they share those electrons. So I can't say one atom gets bigger or smaller. And if we look at the example here, hydrogen with chlorine to form the HCl, the hydrogen's still roughly the same size. The chlorine's still roughly the same size. So what could I point out as changing now? The distance between them, also known as the bond length in big red letters. Okay. If we looked at an ionic bond, we would expect the distance between the nuclei to be the sum of the individual radii because they're getting a transfer of electrons across. In a covalent bond, because they're sharing electrons, those outermost orbitals have to overlap. Well, if they overlap, what happens to the distance between the nuclei? It decreases. It decreases. It's a little bit smaller than the sum of the radii. Okay? A hydrogen's radius is 0 0.037, chlorine 0 0.099. The number that we get is a little bit smaller than the addition, okay? because the orbitals must overlap to share electrons. That's all we're really saying. Okay? I would love to talk about bond energy, um, but that would actually be a lie. I don't, so we're just going to skip it. Okay? And we can move to our compounds and chemical formulas. Does this look familiar to anybody? Everybody's like, no, God, it's horrible. Come on, really? Nobody. What's that? It's just a bunch of Lewis structures. It is a Lewis structure, yeah. Doesn't look good. Probably why you're all still awake. Sugar. Not quite. Not a bad guess. Caffeine. It's caffeine. It's a structure for caffeine. And we look at that, it's big and complex and nasty, and you might panic and freak out, oh, I don't want to have to draw that. You don't have to draw that. Okay? When we look at, at more advanced structures, we start to lose center atoms and everything kind of falls apart on us for using Lewis structure rules. And we come up with some other way to represent this. What's another way to represent that? Huh? What do you mean write it out? I think I started to hear somebody say it. I did say someone said, right, caffeine. Well, that doesn't quite count because that doesn't tell us all the atoms that are present. But we could go through and say C... Seven, because there's seven carbons there. And I could write H. I'm just going to trust you. N. I got four. O. Three. Two. And I now have a chemical formula. Okay. This simplifies some of what I have to write, because I could now ultimately type that out. I don't have to draw out that big fancy structure. Okay? This does remove a lot of information. 
Okay? And I would argue it removes so much information that I should stop using chemical formulas and I should only use structures. You're probably going to be on the other side of that coin because how many of you want to draw out that structure? Yeah, you probably want to stick with the formula. Okay? Most of what we deal with in this class is looking at the formula. Okay? So I know we had that section on Lewis structure and you might be like, well, God, I spent all that time on it. That's because I think it's important. I will test you again on it on exam two. So make sure you understand it. Okay? But for the rest of the time, we're going to go into this formula. What does this formula mean? All of these elements, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen, are all bonded together. Yes. What else does it mean? Because how many of each atom is present? There are seven carbons, ten hydrogens, four nitrogens, two oxygens. Remember when we went through and talked about our atomic notations? We had our symbol. We had the mass. We had the atomic number. Right? And then I said there were two other useful pieces of information that we could include. Charge and the amount. Here's the amount showing up in our chemical formulas. Okay, so you're responsible for pulling that information and recognizing that it is present. Okay? So we've got different chemical formulas. H2O, C6, H6O6, all of those look kind of familiar. Okay. How about HC2, H3O2? Does that one look like it's following a different pattern than the top two? Yeah. Yeah, what's that different pattern? There's two hydrogens. There's two different hydrogens. One of them is pulled out in front and one of them's on the inside. Why would I pull one out in front? Uh, it has nothing to do with that chemical formula or that structure. Say that again? I might be trying to draw attention to the chemical reactivity of that compound. The structure gives me some information about reactivity. The formula does not. But if I tweak my formula and rearrange different pieces, I can call attention to the different reactivities. So a suggestion was made that by putting that H out front, I could start to call attention to that maybe this structure is an acid. Or those of you going, damn, how'd you know that? How'd you know that? Somebody back there. It's a oh, you watched the play posit video. This is why you should be watching the video on nomenclature. Okay, so that you can reference these ideas. Okay? For those of you that watched it, she's only half right, right? Binary. Yes? Yeah. Not binary acid. Well, I'll cover that too here in a second. She's only half right because for it to be an acid, what else do we need? You also officially need the AQ at the end. It's kind of a load of crap, but that's how we're using it in this class. So I would argue, yes, you're right, phenomenal, that was an acid. It really does need the AQ to officially become an acid. A reference was made, it's a binary acid. Binary means two, which is referencing? Two atoms. Not atoms. Two elements. There's only two elements in the formula. Are there only two elements in that formula? No, so it's not a binary acid, it's? A ternary acid. Okay? It's like, oh my god, all these pieces. Yes. You have to process all of these pieces and put it together. Okay? Yes. Uh, is then the one on the right also an acid? So we moved to the right, and you'll notice we did the same thing. Hydrogen has been pulled out, but I didn't pull it out in front. Why not? Because you're being a jerk, Mike. Stop it. It's not my fault. It's not an acid. If I put the hydrogen out front, It'd be an acid. I'd start to think it's an acid. I'm pulling the hydrogen out because its chemistry is different and unique from the other hydrogens. Okay? But it's not so different that it makes it an acid. Okay? So we can change our formulas around to show different representations. You may see formulas have this kind of scattershot approach to them. Okay? I just want you to be aware of that and recognize that there are patterns that show up why we're doing it may not be inherently obvious to you. Don't stress necessarily about that. You do have to stress about the acid one. Okay, everybody going, oh, I don't have to worry about it. No, you have to worry about acids because it's nomenclature. So it's on the test, yes. Okay. 
Are there other notations we could use? Yeah, the one underneath did some also extra kind of fancy footwork on changing things around. We pulled the carbon out. Okay, We're trying to provide some more information about structure. Last one, what have we changed? We've talked about this one a couple times. Is this just a formula for the bottom one? No, what else is in there? How do you know it's a chemical reaction? Okay, we have an arrow which is suggesting the word reacts, okay, or reacted. Okay. We also have this plus sign. What does that plus sign mean? Does it mean bonded? No. No, it's not that they're bonded, it's that these two things were mixed. Okay, how would I know they were bonded? They'd be together in that chemical formula at the end. Okay, kind of makes sense? Very subtle changes in how we approach the language of chemistry, and we get drastically different interpretations. So you have to be familiar with that language to be able to deal with those interpretations. Okay? And because everybody loves nomenclature, four questions. Uh, solve them. This isn't something you turn in. Just work through them. Come up with names or formulas for these four compounds in the next four minutes. It's a minute per one. That's not even fair. I'm not even ready to write. My time is still running. Can't be spelled right. I intentionally did it wrong. Are you timing me? Yeah. Just waiting for someone to actually be like, I'm, I've got you on the clock. So those are saying, well, this is a load of crap. There's no way you could do all that work. I just did it. Okay, and yes, I am the teacher. Okay. Not often. There's a reason why nomenclature is entirely dumped online. I freaking hate nomenclature. Okay. It is, do you know the rule to name this? If you don't know the rule, you're dead in the water. There's nothing you can do to answer it. The nomenclature system is entirely a human invention. Okay. It is an entirely important in human invention, okay. but it is an entirely human invention, and I don't like memorizing human inventions for the sake of human inventions. Okay. It requires practice to manipulate. Okay. The way I did this, because okay, you go, oh, well, you've done this a whole bunch of times. That's true. I could have just written the names outright and the formulas outright, and all of that work was internalized. I'm telling you that when you go through and do nomenclature, you do not internalize the work. You write it down. Did I still do it in less than four minutes? Yes. 
Yes. Okay, so you can write out all of the work. You have to be confident behind that work and that process. That's what I want you to be working towards, is understanding the process so that you can name them all. It doesn't matter what's thrown at you. You work through that process. Everything I just scribbled up there is exactly how I would expect you to go through and solve. Right? Did anybody notice anything about what I went through and did when I solved? What do you see? Well, what I noticed was that with the numbers, you used it as a value of, and you used x and y, I noticed, also. So it equals equal to zero. I set up algebraic expressions to go through and solve these things. It's not a requirement. <laughs> For those of you that are like, crossover method is your thing, that's awesome. As soon as we move into the redox chapter, you're going to have to do this anyway. And you're going to be like, but uh, the crossover method. And it will fail miserably. Okay? I'm showing you this methodology for a reason. Okay? This isn't because I think it requires more effort and I'm trying to make you suffer. I'm trying to set you up so you have the tools to be able to process further on down the line. Okay? That's why I set up the algebra there. Okay? And the meaning behind what that algebra is is another aspect which we'll address here in a second. Uh, I put down what I knew to be true. Did anybody see me write the Roman numeral 3 next to chromium after I wrote chromium? No. no. When did I write the Roman numeral 3? That was very literally the last freaking thing I answered on this entire slide. I didn't go through it linearly. Okay? I wrote down what I knew and moved on. Okay? Even that oxide I initially wrote Oxygen, because I recognized that O was oxygen, but then I recognized it's in a compound. I have to change the ending to I'd. Okay? So I intentionally, every pen stroke on this was intentionally done. Well, maybe not that one. I don't know why that one's there. Okay? That intentionality is things that I want you to be going through and doing when you go through and solve your nomenclature, okay? And ultimately solve everything. And not just in this class, in every other aspect of your life. Be intentional behind what you're trying to do. Right? Or be intentional that you know nothing about what you're trying to do. That's also okay. That's going to be a rough life. Right? You need to be a lot more intentional about putting what you're trying to do down. Right? And that at least sets you up so you know when things are going to slap you in the face. When you intentionally insult someone, you know they're going to slap you. You may not be happy with the repercussions, but at least you knew that going in that you were going to get slapped. Okay? Kind of make sense? Okay. So, anything in particular you want me to talk about? Okay, I saw your hand first. Huh. This is when you have, what happens when you start thinking in your head and you're on a clock. Yeah, 6 divided by 2 would be 3. Yeah. Okay, and if we look at the algebra of that 2, that's where that 2 is coming from. Okay, that's that one. Kelsey, you had a question and then I'll go to Ali. Oh, yeah. So for the lead one, we don't have, we don't automatically know what that one is. That's found in the chart, right? That, that is what I was to memorize. So there's a chart to go through and memorize. You don't memorize anything for lead. Right, and we know we don't have to memorize anything for lead because, because it's written there. And if you go through and look at your chart for lead, I believe the textbook lists it out. That was a horrible thing for the textbook to do. Because when we put it up on the slides and I said I wanted you to memorize these charges, I erased tin and lead. Why? You shouldn't memorize their charges. You have to have them specified. Okay? What I left blank were the X and Y. Okay? Before we get into the X and Y, I'll try and answer Ali's question first and then show another parallel here. Oh, just to make sure I'm, I'm getting this right. So for metal, non-metals, that's when you do the parentheses Roman numerals for Roman numerals, and then for non-metals and non-metals, you do like the dye and the yep. pen. We take a look in the middle. <coughs> we're looking at carbon and oxygen, nitrogen and oxygen. All of those are covalent compounds because they're non-metals. 
that's when we start bringing in these Greek prefixes. You'll notice with the top one and the bottom one, there's no Greek prefixes. Okay, why? It's a different type of compound. It's an ionic compound. The name gives me information about its reactivity. So there's a logic behind the naming system so that by looking at the name, I can predict something of its reactivity. The middle two tend to be the most easy for students to deal with because it's just literally listing off what's there. The top and the bottom or the ionic compounds become a little bit trickier because you have to interpret some information out of that. That's where this algebra expression is coming from. This is the number of the element times the charge on the element. Charge is technically being used incorrectly. Plus the number of the element times the charge on that element. And I would do that continually until I got all of the elements. And then I would add that up, and that would equal not zero, the overall charge. For nomenclature right now, the overall charge for everything you do is zero, which is why zero, zero. Okay, in the formula, it's always given to you. What's written in the upper right-hand corner of that formula, Cr2O3? Nothing is written there. The mathematic symbol for nothing, zero. That's why I could do the zero. Okay? This kind of balance or that equation is really just a fancy way of counting up electrons and protons in the molecule. That's all we're doing. Okay? So if you understand that's the application, we're just applying the number of electrons and protons in the molecule. That's why we're getting a charge. That's the balance. Okay? Unfortunately, we are done. So if you have questions, you can ask. Uh, 